we are now going on to a presentation on lambing, stone sheep lambing habitat selection given by Grace, uh, provided by Grace N, who is also a student, a master's student at the University of Alberta. So Grace, uh, there you are. Can you show your presentation? Looks good. Okay, awesome. I'm unmuted. Okay, hello everyone. Good morning. Thanks, Marco, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Grace Sams, and today I'm going to be presenting some of my master's work on stone sheep partridge and habitat use in the Cassier Mountains. So before I get started, I would first like to acknowledge the land that we were conducting our research on. Uh, so acknowledging the Taltan, Casca, and Dees River First Nations who generously welcomed us onto their land to conduct this research. And they've been integral partners uh, with us on this project. We have so much respect and thank you for these nations who have coexisted and lived with many sheep and goat populations in these regions for thousands of years and have allowed them to be sustained uh, throughout all of that time. So our project is focused on stone sheep, which are a subspecies of thin horn sheep and they reside predominantly in British Columbia. So although these are really majestic and, and super cool creatures, there's a lot, or there's not very much research that has been conducted on them. Most of what we've learned about wild sheep has been through bighorn sheep populations. So our study takes place in the Cassier Mountains, which are found in interior Northern British Columbia. So if you take a look at, there we go. Uh, if you take a look at the map to the right, you'll see a little black box. This is our study area, uh, so just below the Yukon border. And in the Cassier Mountain Range, we have a small stone sheep population. Uh, and the population is dispersed in pretty small uh, and very dispersed bands. And not very much is known about the Cassier stone sheep herd. So most of what we have gathered is from uh, local Indigenous community members, resident hunters, uh, and wildlife um, provincial biologists. Um, but there really hasn't been too many studies taking place in this uh, mountain range. So there's been quite an increase in recreation uh, within the last decade or so, with increases in off-highway vehicle use, so snowmobiling and quadding um, are main examples. Uh, and the potential of increased industry too could threaten critical sheep habitat in this area, um, and especially really critical habitat like parturition or lambing habitat, um, which is really important for sustaining populations of sheep for many generations. So in 2017, the Cassier Stone Sheep Project was established, and this was done by Provincial Wild Sheep and Goat Specialist Bill Jex um, and the lovely veterinarians, Dr. Helen Schwainzi and Kylie Thacker. And so the Cassier Stone Sheep Project had a few overarching goals. The first one was to really build an understanding, uh, just a baseline understanding of the herd's health. And this uh, goal was tackled by Kylie Thacker and she presented her findings on Tuesday. And the second goal of this project was to really dive into the seasonal habitat use and movement behavior of stone sheep. Uh, and in particular, the females of the population um, as they are the reproductive engines, um, keeping these populations going. So I am looking at this second goal here, uh, and today I'm going to be talking about seasonal habitat use and movement behaviors of the parturition period specifically. So in order to work on these goals of this project, we had to go out and capture adult sheep, um, so particularly female adult sheep, in the winters of 2018 and 2019. We did this with helicopter net gun capturing. And during the captures, we conducted routine health samples. And um, we also fitted all adult female ewes with a GPS radio collar. And these collars were collecting GPS locations every one or two hours, um, so quite frequently. And we also assessed the ewes to see if they were pregnant. Uh, if a ewe was found to be pregnant, we would equip them with a vaginal implant transmitter or a VIT. Um, and this is just a small device that uh, is expelled during a birthing event and it notifies researchers of the location and the timing 
of a birthing event. So for this talk, I'm speaking about habitat selection during the parturition period. Um, and to tackle this, I have two main objectives. So the first objective is to estimate parturition dates and then also look at the length of time that a parturient ewe spends at her parturition site. And I'm doing this with our GPS collar data. Then my second objective is to identify landscape features that are influential to female stone sheep's habitat selection during the parturition period. So first to go over this objective one here, I'm just gonna walk you through four main steps that I did take um, when looking at uh, estimating parturition dates. So the first step was to calculate step length and then plot it over time to visually assess movement rate or movement behaviors. So just to explain what a step length is, if you take a look at this handsome ram down here, uh, we have at 10 a.m. a GPS location from him and then again at 11 a.m. So the distance between consecutive GPS locations are called a step length. And in this case, this step length is 100 meters in length. So once we've calculated our step lengths, we are then able to plot it over time. So if we take a look at this plot here, um, on the x-axis we have our dates. So beginning on May 1st to um, about June 5th. And then on the y-axis is our step length. And you can see when we plot these step lengths, there's really large spikes in movement. And then there's also low depressions in movement. And during the lambing period to identify a parturition uh, event, we're really looking for depressions in movement rate for at least two days. Um, but in this case, this one, we identified was around four days. So on May 15th, we would look at this and, and say, okay, this is a potential parturition event occurring. Um, and it looks like it lasted about four to five days. So once we have our estimated parturition dates identified, we then go on to our next step, which is looking at net displacement from the parturition site. So net displacement is the distance of locations from a particular location. So uh, if we look at this plot here, all these black dots indicate our net displacement um, of our GPS locations from that original parturition site that we identified on May 15th. So it looks that um, for about four to five days, that U doesn't appear to move very far from that location uh, and really not even above 100 meters for the first four days from that location. But then we see a large spike in movement um, right here on about day five and a half. Uh, and that just indicates that the U has moved away from that location uh, to somewhere else. And so after we visually inspected the data, we will fit a piecewise regression to this data to identify a natural break in the net displacement. Um, and this is shown with this blue line here. So it basically is just showing where this break occurs and where we're seeing a large increase in net displacement. And with our piecewise regression, we found in this case, our sheep 42697, um, probably stayed at the partition site or near it for about five to 5.2 days. So our fourth step is validating or kind of building some confidence with our partition estimates. Um, and usually when researchers are estimating partition dates, they'll actually go out on the ground and survey for the presence of lambs with ewes. Um, and, and estimate the ages of those lambs to help them solidify their partition date estimates. Uh, so we did have this plan for the summer, but with everything going on with the pandemic, we decided to cancel that um, just to keep everybody safe. Um, so we had to get a bit creative with how we were going to build some confidence with our partition date estimates. Uh, luckily, we had some cool data to work with. So the first option was looking at our VIT expulsion data. So if a VIT was expelled within 24 hours of an estimated parturition date, we assumed that it was pretty likely that a parturition event had occurred. Um, there was likely a lamb born at that time. The second method we used was using a trail camera photos. So we actually deployed trail cameras throughout the Cassier Mountains in the summer of 2019 with the goal of capturing photos of our collared ewes to see if a lamb was present with them. 
So I'll just show a few fun pictures of uh, U42700 that we found, um, that we captured throughout the whole year of 2019. So this is her on June 28th with a very cute lamb at heel following right behind. Um, and again, there's that lamb. Um, so already we're seeing the presence of a lamb with this U. <clears throat> and then again, we see her on October 9th with a lamb as well. And then October 16th, we see her with a lamb again at a very popular mineral lick. And you can see the lamb there in the back actually licking um, at the ground. And again, we see the same U in the year 2020 on May 7th with a yearling. I mean, we can't confirm that this is her yearling, um, but very possible that it is. And, and really cool to be able to see uh, the transition of how, how she's gone through this entire year um, with a lamb. So from these VIT expulsion dates and trail camera photos, we were able to confirm um, that quite a few of our collared ewes that we had estimated gave birth indeed did have a lamb with them. So just to wrap up this objective, um, after we've conducted all these four steps, we then are able to look at the parturition dates for each year and see if there's any general trends with them. So I'm just gonna explain this plot kind of quickly here. Um, so on our x-axis here is time over the typical lambing season. So from May 1st until July 1st, June 30th. And then on the y-axis is cumulative parturition rate. So at zero, that means no births have occurred. And then at one, that means all of the births have occurred for that particular season. Um, in blue here, this blue line uh, is the year of 2018. Um, and we see that the parturition events seem to happen with quite a lag. Um, they're definitely not in sync as much as um, other years like this year, 2019. So in the year 2019, we see that most births have occurred before May, um, May 17th, where almost 80% of all these births have occurred. And then by June 1st, uh, that's it for all of our colored ewes. They have all given birth um, if they were parturing. And then again in 2020, which is this orange line here, it follows a similar trend to the year 2018 with uh, a, quite a long lambing period. Um, and so it's just kind of interesting to be able to plot these different years and see the variation in year to year and the variation in synchronicity between the use. Um, and another finding we found was that the average length of, the, of time that a use spends at her parturition site was about 2.3 days in length. So from these estimates of parturition dates uh, from this objective one, we can then look at our objective two. Um, by identifying landscape features that influence stone sheep habitat selection during the parturition period. So in order to look at this second objective, we're using resource selection functions. And so I developed a suite of resource selection functions um, using mixed effect logistic regression and a used versus available design. Uh, so I'm just gonna briefly go over what this analysis is all about. So if we take a look down here at this light green shape, this is representing a parturient use home range during the parturition period. And then we see these yellow dots here. Um, these yellow dots indicate the GPS locations of a U during the parturition period. So these are locations we call used points. Uh, we know this individual has used those points. And then in blue dots, um, this is representing our available locations. So these are the locations that were available to that U within her home range. Um, but in this case, she did not use those locations. So once we have our U's and available locations picked, we then, are, we then extract or measure different habitat features at each point. So looking at uh, certain topographic um, variables like elevation, slope, ruggedness, and then looking at aspect with the variables northness and eastness. And then lastly, we wanted to get an understanding of, of vegetation at these different habitats. Um, so using maximum NDVI to do that, our normalized difference vegetation index. And so once we have a suite of all of our models, we then selected our top model. So our, our best predictive model that predicted parturition habitat selection 
using uh, an AIC score of less than two between competing models. So just to go over our results pretty quick um, of what we found for our top predictive model um, was that the variables that seem to be important to uh, parturient use habitat selection were elevation, ruggedness, slope, northness and eastness, which again are measures of aspect. And then maximum NDVI can also help us predict habitat selection. So I'll just briefly explain um, what we found for each variable. So we found that sheep are selecting for high elevation habitats um, and also habitats with very rugged terrain and at intermediate slopes. So not extremely steep, steep slopes uh, like cliff sides, um, but definitely not flat slopes either. So somewhere in between. Uh, and this is really indicative of you selecting for habitat that facilitate predator avoidance. So this wasn't really any new findings. Um, it's quite similar to research done by bighorn sheep parturition, um, but it is neat to actually see that stone sheep are behaving quite similarly. And then looking at northness and eastness, what we found from this is that sheep are actually selecting for north facing slopes, um, which was kind of an interesting finding. Um, I had predicted that they'd be selecting for more south facing slopes to avoid deep snow cover. So still trying to untangle uh, the reasoning for that. If anybody has any ideas, I'd, I'd love to hear. So give me a shout. Um, and lastly, looking at maximum NDVI. So we found that sheep are selecting for very low values of NDVI. And what that basically means to us is that sheep are selecting habitats that are very rocky and that have limited forage. Um, and this again was, was pretty expected. We aren't expecting that during the parturition period when a lamb's or when a ewe is trying to keep a lamb safe, she's not selecting habitat that has the best forage available. She's typically selecting habitat that um, uh, helps avoid predation. So from this top model, we are able to build predictive maps. So I'll just show you a photo here of a predictive map that we have created for the parturition period. Um, and it's showing the suitable lambing or partition habitat across the Cassier Mountain Range. So you can see in red, these are the areas that are highly suitable habitat. Um, so based on our predictive model, this is where we think um, that sheep could or likely would select for to give birth. Um, and from a conservation standpoint, these are the habitats that are really critical and in more need of protection or conservation in comparison to all of these other habitats in green locations where it's unlikely that a sheep would choose to give birth. So from this model, um, we're actually going to be sharing this with uh, provincial wildlife biologists um, and land planners and to really help inform decision-making. Um, so decision-making decision -making with conservation initiatives um, and land planning in the future to really ensure that these important critical habitats will be protected and, and we do know where they are now. Uh, so just to wrap up my presentation, uh, this project has demonstrated that we can identify parturition dates of stone sheep use using GPS collar data. And from these estimated parturition dates, we can then look at habitat selection during that critical parturition period. Uh, we found that parturient ewes are selecting lambing habitat sites um, at high elevations with very rugged terrain and intermediate slopes um, that are north facing and with very sparse vegetation. And from this uh, model, we were able to predict suitable parturition habitat uh, across the Cassier Mountain landscape, which is going to be beneficial for the conservation of stone sheep or of this particular stone sheep population um, by providing this to wildlife managers. And the next steps that uh, I have been working on are to look at habitat selection of our female collared stone sheep throughout various seasons throughout the year. Um, and within each season also developing predictive habitat suitability maps, um, again, to share with our uh, provincial wildlife um, team to make informed decisions to ensure that stone sheep are going to stay on these mountains, on these mountains for many generations to come. Uh, so with that, I would just like to, to say a big thank you to all the people who have really supported me and supported our project team to make this project possible. And a big shout out to our funding partners who have funded all of this research and, and made this project uh, come true. And, and yeah, so thank you to all of the people who helped 
with this project. And thanks everybody for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Grace. Uh, that was excellent. Very good way of showing how we can use technology now to find out things that before we just had to more or less guess. Thank you. Uh, there's a few questions. I think I'll only take the first one. Uh, uh, it's about the beta for Northness, and Megan uh, points out that it's really not a very strong predictor re relative to other betas. And could it be that the snow is simply more firm or north facing aspects, so it's easier to walk on? Yeah, thank you for sharing that idea. That, that was one thought that I had, um, especially if there's snow everywhere um, or all over these cold northern landscapes. It's very possible that it is easier movement, easier walking on north facing slopes. Um, and I just got some data with snow cover. So that's actually something I'm going to kind of untangle. So thanks for that idea. Um, the northness beta, it does look small, um, but uh, so what we're looking at is that the confidence intervals don't overlap with zero to see if it is significant. Um, so we did find it's a significant variable, um, but yes, the beta is just a bit smaller, but, but still came out as significant. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Grace. There's another question. Please look at the Q&A and answer. And uh, I have a few okay. questions I'll be sending to you later. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's go on uh, to the next speaker. Before I introduce Meg, uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, unfortunately the first talk after uh, the next short break has been uh, canceled. So we'll switch all the talks up by one. And that means that uh, we'll have a longer uh, lunch break. So we start the lunch break at 10 to 12 uh, Alberta times uh, 20 minutes earlier. So uh, let's go on 